welcome. Thank you for coming uh, to this talk. So I'm going to talk about how to analyze your data at the speed of light with Polars and Kedro. So this is what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to set the scene a little bit and explain what problem are we trying to solve with Kedro and why it might be interesting for you. I'm going to describe a little bit what is Kedro and and then we're going to jump to the demo part, in which I'm going to show very quickly how you can do some exploratory data analysis using the Polar's data print library. This is not necessarily an in-depth introduction to Polar's. For that, there will be a talk by the creator of Polar's that uh, made it to this conference later on today. And then we're going to see how to use Kedro from Jupyter Notebook. And we're going to start creating our data pipelines so to transform our initial Jupyter notebook into maintainable data science code that is going to take the shape of a Python data. But before I continue, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Juan Luis. I'm a developer advocate at Quantum Black, which is a company part of McKinsey. And originally, I'm an aerospace engineer, so I learned Python on myself and on my own. Um, and I love the Python community and open source communities in general, and that's why I'm here and why I keep coming to Python events all over the world, because uh, I like it so much. And on my way to becoming a Kedro expert, and I hope uh, you can join me in this journey today. So first of all, what's the problem that you're solving? Well, imagine that you're building a house. This house will be unstable unless it has proper uh, foundations and a proper blueprint and so on. And the same thing happens with data science. If we apply proper software engineering principles to it, then our code will be more maintainable and easy uh, for others to pick up and so on. And if we don't, then we will have a hut instead of a house, which sometimes it's fine. I mean, you don't necessarily uh, need a lot of infrastructure to extract some insights, but the moment your data science code goes beyond just extracting some insights and you have to maintain it in production and so on, then if you're not applying proper software engineering principles, then everything starts falling apart. I don't know what's. I think it's me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll have to cope with it. So bear with me. Um, so these are some quotes that we extracted by interviewing real data scientists um, from our company and our clients and so on. And you might be familiar with many of these statements, right? Like everybody. Uh, approaches data science projects in a way, or my code would not run in someone else's machine, or uh, uh, the dependencies cannot be installed, etc. Right? So these kind of problems arise uh, very often. And what if I told you that the machine learning part is not the hard part? And let's be clear, this is a bit of an exaggeration, right? Because machine learning is actually hard. But the point is that just stopping at the data science part of it is not the end of the story, because most of the times we want this to deliver actual value um, for a long period of time. So this is the problem that we are trying to solve with Kedro. So Kedro is an open source Python framework for machine learning and data science. It tries to apply the 12-factor app philosophy to data science, things like modularity, separation of concerns, versioning, and so on. And it tries to address some of the shortcomings of Jupyter notebooks, uh, the ones that usually happen uh, in big teams, with a focus on how to create maintainable data science code. So you can think of Kedro as uh, React or Django for data science. It's kind of a framework, and it's not a full-fledged and MLOps solution, as we're going to see later. It has been given a number of awards over the years, and it has more than 8,000 GitHub stars. Maybe with your help, you will have a few more. 
this is how the current logo and everything looks like. And very important, Kedro is uh, developed by a series of different stakeholders. So it's not a product that is exclusively developed by Quantum Black anymore. In fact, uh, the company donated it to the Linux Foundation some years ago, and we're making progress towards adding more people that want to be part of the Technical Steering Council. So in fact, we have uh, added some more developers from other companies uh, very recently. And our idea is that uh, many people from outside of my career uh, can participate in the development. So this is what Kedro gives you. On one hand, for new projects, it gives you uh, project templates. In fact, it uses cookie cutter under the hood, so you might be already familiar with it. And it's in inspired by the cookie cutter data science project that uh, was created by Driven Data. And, and it adds a little bit more um, structure to it. And then one of the key pieces of Kedro is the data catalog. So we're going to see an example of how that looks like, but essentially the idea is that you will be able to declare how your data sets look like and where they are on disk or what remote locations they have and so on, and decouple those definitions from the actual code that is using them. Then it gives you some tools to write what we call nodes and pipelines. So nodes are essentially Python functions, and then we will assemble those into a limited acyclic graph, right, of that, um, that will do all our data processing for us. And finally, Kedro is extensible, so there's a series of uh, plugins that the community has written over the years, and there are also some hooks uh, that you can um, use to modify how the library behaves. So in our um, idea, uh, we want you to use Kedro for most of the data science or data analysis process from the raw uh, data ingestion up to the model validation and training and so on. And then we defer to orchestrators such as Airflow or Prefix and many others um, so that you can put uh, all of these to a larger scale. So Kedro is often compared to a number of similar uh, or overlapping projects. You might have heard of some of these. I'm not going to go over all this list, but just to mention a few. For example, PBT has become really popular uh, in recent years for people working in cloud data warehouses and doing mostly SQL transforms, even though PBT does support Python these days. And so Kedro is uh, often compared to that. You also have BBC, which started as a uh, version control for your data, but now it does uh, a bit more. And then you have things like MLflow, which actually can integrate with Kedro through uh, an existing plugin. And Intake, that gives you a data catalog as well, but not as flexible or powerful. And the, all the orchestrators uh, category. So, you already knew this, the space of data science tools and frameworks is quite congested and there are lots of uh, alternatives out there, so it's worth presenting them um, for people to make their own choices. So Kedro is used, of course, a lot inside Quantum Black and McKinsey, uh, both directly and also as part of uh, what we call vertical, so more uh, user-facing products that we deliver to clients, but it's also used in many other companies. Some of these are participating in the Kedro Steering Council, like Getting Data, for example, that also produces some plugins for deploying Kedro to different platforms. And then we have some uh, very well-known users uh, like NASA and uh, Caterpillar and others. To stay in touch with the Kedro community, and there's a number of ways. So the main one is joining our Slack workspace, um, um, where you can ask any questions you might have, stay in touch with uh, announcements, and so on. 
The documentation is hosted on Read the Docs, so you can go to docs.kedro.org and browse all our docs there. And then the source code is hosted on GitHub. This is fully open source. So you can also have a look at what's our roadmap and so on. And that's it for the introduction. It's workshop time, so I'm going to stop presenting for a moment. I'm going to go here to the workshop material. So this is the material we're going to use. I'm going to click open on GitHub. Uh, already, so things can start loading in the background. I'm going to do everything in a cloud development environment, so you can try this too if you want to follow along. Maybe it's going to start now. And um, the title of the workshop does not match the title of the talk, but the contents are the same. So the idea or the story is that you're a machine learning engineer that just arrives to the team and your data scientist has given you a Jupyter notebook and you have to put it into production, right? And we're going to first see whether the notebook actually runs or not. And this data scientist was uh, very professional, so the notebook actually works. Um, but we're going to gradually uh, transform that into a Python library and then a Kedro project so that we can move part of the business logic that does the data cleaning, transformation, and so on, into a Python library and normal functions inside modules and so on, so that it's going to be easier to maintain. The data that we're going to use is uh, the Open Repair dataset. So the Open Repair Alliance is a group of volunteers that advocate for the right to repair. So the rights of repairing your own smartphones and laptops and so on. And they do what they call uh, repair cafes, which are events mostly around Europe that um, invite people to bring any uh, device that they have broken at home, like a vacuum uh, machine or a light bulb or whatever, and they try to repair that uh, for them. And they're very systematic, so we have a data set of over 80,000 records of people that try to repair some uh, appliance or a device, and whether the repair could be done or not, and if not, what was the reason it could not be done. And so that's what we're going to use, and we see that things are ready here. So, we're about to start. Before I get to the practical part, are there any questions or comments that you want to ask? Otherwise, you can stop me and interrupt me at any point. So, I'm going to just get started. Okay, so we start uh, with a project like this. This is the JupyterLab interface. I don't think it's the last one, it's the 3.5. Um, I don't know if you know it, but 4.0 was released like three days ago or something like that. So I encourage you to try it out. Uh, but in any case, it's the familiar Jupyter Lab interface uh, that we all know. And I have a notebook here that performs some exploratory um, data analysis. So I'm going to uh, give me some vertical space over here. There we go. Can you see it well from the back? Or should I increase the zoom a little bit more? Okay. Okay, and as I told you, we're going to use uh, polars for this. So let's give it a very quick tour of how polars for data analysis uh, looks like. So I'm going to import it, import polars as PL. And then I'm going to use the read CSV function from Polar, which behaves uh, as you might expect from the name. It's going to take a path uh, to a CSV file and return a Polar data frame. There's a couple of things here that I need to adjust um, for this particular file because um, the way Polar guesses the data types of the columns uh, doesn't work pretty well for this particular data set because there's some inconsistencies in the data, not in polars. 
And so I need to specify that one column would be a float and the other one would be a string. I'm also telling Boris to try to parse the dates and then I'm calling df.head to see the first often the first lines of the file. And this is what we got. So it's not a huge data set, and so it went really fast. And what we have here is uh, an ID of the event. We're not going to pay much attention to this. What was the data provider or the local group that was uh, submitting this part of the data? In which country did this happen? Um, and a normalized product category, uh, like a single machine or a laptop, we're going to see what what's in there in a moment. Uh, what's the brand, if it's known, or all the data of the products, and what was the status of the products, and if it could not be repaired, then what was the uh, reason uh, for that. And then sometimes we will have a description of the problem, and this is written in the local language, so later on we'll have time for the data science parts, we will filter only the ones that are written in English. So this is how it looks like. And then we're going to see that it has over 80,000 records. And we also have a data set that contains the categories um, of uh, each of the products. So we have a mapping between the product category ID and the product category. You have already seen that the product category is already in the data set, but uh, I don't trust it basically, because there could be inconsistencies and so on. So what I'm going to start doing is merging or joining both the events data with the category mapping on the product category ID, so that I ensure that the categories are consistent. So after I read that, I'm going to do this join operation. And let's I stop here for a moment to see what's going on. So the way to uh, filter columns in Polars was, is a little bit different than what we used to in Pandas. So, for example, if we want to select a particular column, then we could do something like this. So we can select the product category. And then it gives me a new data frame only with that uh, column. But you see that I'm passing here not the name of the column itself, but this object. And the interesting thing is that this object is an entity on its own in Polars. And this is going to be very powerful because it allows me to express what computation do I want to do on one hand and then apply that computation to a particular data frame. And that's one of the main features of the Polars API. So what I'm doing here is telling Polars to select all the columns except the product category, so I'm removing the product category from the events dataset, and then I'm joining that with the categories on the product category ID. And if I display the result, then I get something that is really similar, it's just that the product category column is at the end. But now I'm uh, confident that at least it has uh, internal consistency. The final data frame has the same number of rows, and I can do some exploratory data analysis now. For example, how many events are there for each country? So you see this is very uh, familiar. I'm picking only the country column like this, then I computed the value counts, and then I'm sorting that result by the counts column in a descending uh, way. So um, we see that um, the country that appears the most is Great Britain with 23,000 events, and then we have Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, and Denmark. I can also see uh, the kind of product categories that I have, and this is uh, again the same code. So you see that most of the times people have broken lamps and vacuums and open laptops, but there's uh, really a little bit of uh, everything. Now, there's one thing that we need to fix in this uh, data set. This is a very uh, nice and easy exercise of data quality. You know that in the real world, this is not like that, uh, doing the data quality in five minutes. Um, but there's one thing, and it's that the repair barrier, which is uh, a series of um, normalized strings, uh, has 
two of them that are very similar. So there's product to worn out and item to worn out. And I went to the website uh, where I downloaded the data from, and basically there's uh, an inconsistency in the standard. That's why there's two uh, different strings for the same thing. So what we're going to do to have more realistic statistics is we're going to replace one by the other. So for that, I'm doing this. So I'm picking that column, and then I'm mapping this value, so item two worn out, and I'm replacing that by product two worn out. And if that's not the value that happens in that row, then I'm telling it to use the actual value of the column, right? So I'm leaving everything as it is, except for the item two worn out. Then when I do that, then I see that uh, I only have product two worn out, and this is the sum of the other two. Okay, so with this data set where I did the join so that I have, I'm more confident of the categories. And I did a little bit of data cleaning, so I replaced one value by the other. Now I'm confident that I can start doing some actual data science here, right? Um, but, you know, this notebook is not too long. It only has like 12 cells so far. But um, you can probably imagine that some of these uh, notebooks that start by loading the raw data and then doing some pre-processing and so on can get really, really long. Like maybe hundreds, uh, like 100 or 200 cells is not too uh, weird. I've seen worse things uh, out there. So we want to gradually move all this business logic back to a Python function so that uh, I don't need to run all these steps every time I want to uh, start working with the data, basically. And that's what we're going to start doing now um, using Keto. So until now, any questions or comments? So far so good? Okay, so let's get started then. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the Kedro catalog. So the catalog is a component that, as I mentioned a moment ago, allows you to declare what your data sources are and uh, where are they located, basically, and any other uh, options that we need to load the data. So for that thing to work, I'm going to move back to my uh, Visual Studio Code interface. It's right here. And I'm going to start doing some operations. So first of all, I'm going to pip install Kedro. And it's going to take the latest version, which is 0.18.8, released a few days ago. People in the back, you're right just in time for the practical part. And now that I have a cater running, I'm going to uh, define uh, my catalog index. So for that, there's a little bit of boilerplate that I need to write that is going to go away as soon as I create a full-fledged cater index. So I'm going to just uh, follow the instructions here that you have written in the readme. You know, like this is going to render. Yeah. So now we're going to uh, use a catalog, as I said, and the Polar's data set that we're going to use is still uh, experimental, or better said, it's not released as part of a stable version of Kedro data sets. So we will need to install a development version of it. So what I'm going to do is, here in my requirements.txt, I'm going to add Kedro uh, compatible with 0.18.8. I'm going to just copy paste what version of the data set do I need, which is this one here. There we go. That's it. So I'm going to give install lines R requirements.txt 
And this is going to install a compatible version of Polars, uh, an up-to-date version of Kedro, and that's it. So now I have the requirements that I need. I'm going to proceed. I need, as I said, a little bit of uh, boilerplate and for a standard Kedro project to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my data that at the moment is sitting in this data directory. There are a few chairs uh, at the front, by the way, if you want to move forward. So I'm going to create a 01 raw directory here, and I'm going to move all of these files right there. There we go. So now my data lives in data 01. This is because of a convention that is going to make sense in a moment. I don't want to open the CSV file. And then after I create that, I will need to create the actual catalog. So I'm going to create uh, two directories, one called conf slash base, which is going to be my base catalog. And then another one that is required by Pedro, but we're not going to use, which is conf slash local. Inside conf base, I'm going to create my catalog.yml. So in this catalog, is uh, it, this is a YAML file where I'm going to define all my data sets, both the initial ones that I'm going to load and also any intermediate data sets that I need for my processing. So again, um, I could uh, copy paste this uh, here, but let's analyze a little bit what's uh, going on. So I have to include the name of the data set that I'm going to call Open Repair 03 Raw. I think it's Events Raw. That is going to be the name of the data set. Then I need to specify what's the path, and for that, I'm going to just copy paste this. This is the file path. So this is uh, the relative path relative to the root of my project of where the data lives. And I need to specify what is the type of the data set, and this is a Kedro thing. So I'm going to use polars.csv data sets. And then finally, I need to add some extra arguments um, for polars.readcsv to load this file. And you already remember from the notebook that we needed to specify a couple of things. So we wanted to try to parse the dates. So I'm going to do just that. Dot args is try parse dates is true. And then we have a little bit of a problem here because uh, these two objects are actually Python objects, not uh, strings that I can write in, um, in the YAML file. So I will need to uh, use some of the advanced configuration techniques in Kedro. So I'm going to put here the dtypes um, dictionary, and then I know that my product h, sorry, product, thank you, is supposed to be a Polars float 64, but I'm going to write it in this way, so Polars float 64. I'm going to explain what this is in a moment. And then my group identifier is a identifier is a UTF-8. I think that's it. So the idea here is that instead of using the normal um, configuration loader of Kedro, I'm going to use a library called OmegaConf that some of you might already know. It's what powers Hydra, the configuration system, the configuration system used by uh, I think the uh, PyTorch people to configure some of the hyperparameters and so on. And we're going to use that um, to load this configuration file. So now I'm going to take a little bit of uh, boilerplate into my Jupyter notebook. So I will need to do a series of imports here. To read me rendering is working a bit slow, but no problem. So I'm going to do from Kedro config import templated config loader. 
then from Kedro IO import <laughs> the decadro. Then I have to instantiate my configuration loader. So I'm going to do conf loader is my templated config loader that takes some parameters that I'm going to fill now. And sorry, I'm actually going to use the omega conf config loader. And what I'm going to do from omega conf import omega conf, I'm going to define a custom resolver that is going to translate in the YAML file what are those special keys that I wrote with these braces, polars, and so on, into um, something that actually retrieves the polars context. So for that, we should move this cell over here because I'm also going to need it. And then I'm going to say omega conf. I'm going to add a new resolver, so register new resolver. And I need to specify what's the, the key that I'm going to use, which is this part, sorry, which is this part over here, so it has to be called polars. And then um, I'm going to define a function that does the work. So for any attributes that I want to retrieve, then I need to get other from PL that attributes. And that should be it. And if I didn't make any mistake, which I did. Oh, the config source, sorry. And the config source is going to be the conf directory. What is going on? Oh, I need to not run this cell twice. There we go. Okay, so now I have my configuration loader, and my configuration loader can uh, read all the files that are under the conf directory, and I'm going to use that to instantiate my data catalog. So this is going to look like this. My catalog is going to be equal data catalog from config, my configuration loader, and before that, I need to actually load the file. So after I do that, I have my catalog here, and I did all of this so that I can specify now catalog.load, and here is where the actual catalog comes into place, because now I can say, give me the open repair 03 events raw datasets, that is not there because I made a typo, most likely. Open Reaper. Sorry. It's not finding it. That it's interesting. Okay, this is the God of Light demos that is uh, uh, bothering me a little bit. So I'm going to do a shortcut. Um, it switch. I'm going to just show you how it looks like. So I'm going to remove that for a moment. Workshop steps. Four. Exactly. So this should already uh, be working, hopefully. So I'm going to just reopen this logo here. Okay, so for some reason it was not working before, but now it's working. And as you can see, I can do this catalog.load with the name of the dataset. And it has the same effect of uh, loading it from borders. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and and reflect on what, what we just did. So I had to write a bunch of boilerplates that is going to go away in a moment. And 
with the objective of decoupling the notebook itself from where the code lives. So now instead of doing polars.readcsv and then the path of the file and the parameters that I need and so on, I'm going to do catalog.load and the name of the data sets. That data set name is uh, living in the catalog.yaml file so that I can uh, refer to that without necessarily knowing where the file lives uh, and so on. So tomorrow this could move to a S3 bucket or require other options because the data set has slightly changed, but the notebook is going to be the same and I will not uh, be forced to touch it. Okay, so, so far so good. Questions, comments? Oh, yes. So for this data source, you use that flat file. What are the other possibilities? Can you connect to S3? Yes, we are using internally FS spec. You might uh, know it. FS spec. Which is an abstract file system specification. So this could refer to something that lives on disk, but it can also be an S3 bucket or uh, um, like some file that you're downloading from the internet. It doesn't matter because um, as long as the there's an FS spec implementation for that, it's going to work. Anything else? Okay, so I'm going to move forward, and I don't want to do all the rest of the workshop doing live coding, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit uh, through the steps. So the next thing that um, I would want to do here uh, is to transform this um, into a Python library. I could stop um, here, like if you only want to use the Kedro catalog, you're free to uh, add this boilerplate on top and then continue. But if I turn this into an actual um, Kedro project in a Python library, I will be able to use some shortcuts. In particular, there's a Jupyter extension for Kedro that loads the catalog automatically. But also, I will be able to define my, uh, my pipelines, which is my end goal. So I'm going to move forward one step. And let me see. What is going on? I don't know how to use Git anymore. Is that it? <laughs> um, turn the code into a Python library. Okay. So, what I did here, I am going to spare you the details, but basically, uh, Kato works with any uh, project that uh, is a proper Python library with its packaging metadata and so on. So what I did was uh, create the pyproject.toml that for those of you that don't know, it's the modern replacement of setup.py. Uh, using Flix, you can use Hatch or PDM or Poetry or anything, any workflow tool of your choice. And then added some uh, packaging metadata here. So basically declaring what's the project name, the dependencies, and so on. I need to add some Kedro configuration as well. Basically repeating again what's the package name, the project name, and telling what Kedro version I'm mean, using for that. The side effect of this is that when I do Kedro minus minus help now, there's a bunch of extra commands that appear, uh, because now and uh, this is recognized as a uh, Kedro project. And if I restart this, if I reopen this notebook again, you see that the amount of boilerplate has been greatly reduced because now I can do load extension Kedro.ipython. And after that, there's a catalog variable that gets fed into the notebook automatically. So I don't need to do all the 
boilerplate that I did before. That boilerplate is defined somewhere else, uh, but it's not visible from the notebook. So I'm making slow progress towards making the notebook experience a little bit cleaner uh, while retaining the uh, Kedro catalog uh, nice things that we know. And then finally, um, what time it is? Okay. So I'm going to show you now how uh, would you go and create some uh, pipelines, and then I'm going to uh, just show how they're looking when they're finished. So after I have a Kedro project, I can do Kedro pipeline. There's a couple of options here, so I can create a new pipeline that can be called data processing. And when I do this, there's a bunch of files and directories that are created for me automatically. In particular, you see that I have a new open repair pipelines. I have two files, one called notes, which is where my functions are going to be. For example, the function that is going to join two data sets, and then the function that is going to perform this small data cleaning step. And then there's a pipeline.py, which is where I'm going to define how these nodes are linked together. And again, I'm going to fast forward to how this uh, looks like. Equal base. Mm. Going to very quickly move forward. There we go. Okay, so after I create the data processing pipeline, this is how the nodes are going to look like. So, on one hand, I have my joint events categories, and you see this function takes two Polar's data frames, and it's going to return another Polar's data frame. So essentially, I created one node to do this specific task. And then I have another function that is consolidate barriers, which is doing this translation that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and again, returning another porous data frame. So these are standalone functions that you can use outside of Kedro, and they are a, a, a good practice in itself. And then I have my pipeline that is going to create, uh, to link two nodes. And this is where, uh, uh, Kedro is uh, joining the catalog entries that you defined in the catalog.jml file that I showed before with the actual nodes doing the processing. So you see that one node is going to be the join events categories function. This node that takes two Polar's data frames has two inputs, and you see that I'm passing a list of <coughs> catalog names. So this is open repair events row, and then another data set that is open repair categories. The output of that is going to be another data set called Open Repair Combined. And that data set is going to be the input of the next node. So um, the consolidated variables will take the as input the output of the joint events uh, categories. After I define that, you see that my data directory for now only has a 0, 1 row. Uh, directory, but now if I do Kedro run, this is going to uh, perform all the processing steps um, and executing the two nodes that I have. By default, um, this is not going to store the results of the processing on disk because uh, we have something called the default data set that is the memory data set. So at the beginning, unless you define the data sets properly, it's not going to be stored on disk. But um, the next step is to take the output of the end of the pipeline and define that as another data set. So I'm going to show you how that looks like. Now this is my final catalog. So you see it has a bunch of 
other entries here. And since now the open repair 03 is defined as a polar CSV dataset in itself, when I do kdro run, now inside my data directory, there are two new directories appear. What one, the intermediate one, and one, the, the primary one. So the intermediate result of the processing and the final result of the pipeline are going to be stored uh, on disk. And that's it for the first uh, pipeline. I went a little bit fast, but... but does it matter how much stuff do you have if all the stuff ends up in the intermediate? You don't have to have all the intermediate steps on disk. For example, if I were to remove this data set declaration here, and I delete this directory, and just for demonstration purposes, I delete the other one as well. When I do kdro run, you see since the default dataset is a in-memory dataset, the intermediate result is going to be passed in memory from one node to the other, and only the second one is going to be serialized. So it's up to you whether you want to like, store the intermediate results or not. Any other question about this? Okay, and I'm going to finish the talk and hopefully have some time for questions by showing the full store. There we go. By showing one more thing. So what was the idea of all of this? The idea was to be able to do some data science, but using the clean final data sets that we can run. And this is what uh, I'm doing here. So this is a new notebook. And I'm going to create a couple of plots out of this. Um, and as you can see, I'm calling catalog.load with the final data set um, directly. So I don't have to call in this particular notebook uh, about the data cleaning and data pre-processing. So essentially what I'm going to do is plotting the amount of events that is going to happen in every year. And you see that uh, more or less it has increased, but there has been an obvious parenthesis during the pandemic because these, these events were in person. And I'm going to skip that a little bit. And this is a relative plot of all the barriers. And you can see also that over the years, they introduced a little bit more granularity. So at the beginning, it was just spare parts not available. But nowadays, they can also distinguish whether there was no way to open the product, which is getting more common these days, or the product was too worn out, and things like that. I'm going to end with uh, word clouds. So I'm filtering here only the uh, events that took place in Great Britain. And then I'm taking this word cloud, and you can see lots of words that you would expect, right? It's not working, stopped working, enable, uh, CD player, because uh, these tend to break a lot, and, and so on. So, and with this I finish. The final thing that I want to show you is that you can visualize both the graph of operations you're doing, and also, if you persist them, the output. So I'm going to pip install my requirements was once more requirements.txt. Hope this doesn't take a lot of time. There we go. And there's a plugin in Kedro called Kedro Base that allows you to do this uh, visualization. Has a little bit. There we go. That's quite a number of dependencies on it because it's a web application based on fast API, by the way. And then if I do Kedro base, and I wait a few seconds for this to load, this error, luckily I can ignore it. So I'm going to just give it a couple of seconds. And then I open the browser here, and I have this wonderful visualization interface for the graph itself. So you can see here that these are the two data sets that I was using at the beginning. So the events and the categories. And then this represents one of the nodes, this is the intermediate data sets, and this is the final word cloud uh, plot that I was um, persisting to the nodes. 
that for some reason is not shown here, probably some slowness in the network or something like that. But in any case, I'm going to leave that here. So going back to the presentation just for closing. OK, so I hope that you found Kedro interesting and that uh, you give the borders integration a try. We're going to launch some research on the Kedro documentation. So if you want to participate, uh, feel free to drop us a message in Slack or reach out my colleague, Joe Stichuri, the technical writer of the team. And that's it from my side. I hope uh, if you enjoyed, you have all the uh, material on GitHub. And I'll be happy to take any questions in the final minutes we have. Thank you.